a small screen from your home, maybe your computer or your iPad. It is a privilege to be here talking uh, with Father John O'Connor, one of the most um, famous priests in our diocese, the author of Food for Faith. Uh, you may have seen him before online or in your in reality. And uh, it is a privilege that we pray for vocations. And today, Father John, I'll ask him a few questions about the the three vows of our religious life, um, obedience, chastity, and poverty. Father John, what is it? What are they? <laughs> Whoa, you don't waste time. <laughs> you know, people, when they think of priests, they think of poverty and celibacy and obedience. They think, wow, that's a, that's a really hard life. But what, what we forget is that this is what every baptized person is called to in some way. Certainly poverty and obedience, and not necessarily celibacy, which is not being married, but chastity. Every baptized person, every Christian is called to chastity. And uh, we, we just want to reflect together on how these three things, poverty and chastity and obedience, are really a wonderful way of living. And if, would it help? Should I just say a little piece about each of them and then you can yeah. ask your next hard question? That would be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, it will give me. Um, first of all, poverty. When we think of poverty, we think of um, not having money or not having material possessions, and that can be part of it. But some people who I know who do have a lot of money really live poverty. And some people I know who have no money at all don't live poverty at all because they're grasping after the money. That's not poverty. So poverty is, um, is a way of living in freedom. So when we, are, when we are attached to a desire for money or material possessions, what we're trying to do is to, to build up a security on earth because we don't really trust God to keep us secure. So poverty is a way of living that really is beautifully free because we trust that God will provide everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. I can't see if anyone's nodding when they're watching at home, so you can just tell me that. Any thumbs up? Great. So it's just a word on poverty. I'm going to jump to obedience next because people think, well, how do you live obedience? Well, do you know the people who live obedience most, I think, are married. Because when you're married, you, like, you know, if I want to do something in the afternoon or at night, I can go and do it usually, as long as I don't have parish commitments. But when you're married, you're working in really close relationship with another person, and there's an obedience in that. Mm. Now, I know some people who are married, that, you know, they're, they're both really happy, and the wife or the husband comes home from work and says, I've just got a job offer, only problem is it's... Um, I'm going to choose another wonderful part of our diocese as an example. It's on the Chatham Islands. And she really wants to go because it's the Chatham Islands. And he's saying, well, I've got a good job here in Christchurch. But they think about it and discuss it and they decide, okay, we'll go. That's obedience. See, it's an obedience to something that's greater. And then the, the third one, just a word about that to start us off, is um, notice I'm not talking about celibacy, which is simply not being married. We're talking about chastity. And what chastity means is living my sexuality in the way that's appropriate to my life calling. So for a priest, that not only means not being married, but not being in a, in a sexual relationship uh, either. But for the person who's married, you can't be in any sexual relationship that you choose either. You choose one. And that's, that's chastity, living expressing living my sexuality in a way that's appropriate to my life calling. Now, of course, that also goes for someone who is, who is single. They're called to live their sexuality in a way that's appropriate to their life calling. Is that enough to start us off? That's very good. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, religious, normally they belong to a religious order. Yeah. And those vows mean something that they, they, are will, they normally they should be willing to offer themselves here in, in terms of poverty. They don't normally keep money, is it right? And whatever they live on, yeah. is it distributed to them by, by their religious order or by donations? Uh, 
Is that the way? Is that the way? I think, be... No, you're going to have to ask someone who's a religious priest. I'm a priest of a diocese in, in Tien. We're both priests of a diocese. So we are diocesan priests. We are committed, the two of us, to working in the diocese under the leadership of the Bishop of the Christchurch Diocese and whatever the bishop discerns um, the need is. Um, as diocesan priests, we receive um, a, um, a salary which is based on the minimum wage. But we do fine. I mean, you don't see many poor diocesan priests around. Like We do, we do fine. Um, we have to budget like everyone else because the important thing for a diocesan priest is that our lives resemble the lives of the people that we serve, the people in parishes. You, you have to budget, like you have to make some tough decisions around money. If you, if you want to holiday in a particular place, you've got to budget, you've got to save, so you can do that. Well, diocesan priests, are, we do that as well. A religious community, and this is my very limited and naive understanding of religious communities, in a religious community, um, it's the, the bursar or the superior who holds the, the purse strings. So if you want something, you ask for it, and if it's required, it's provided. Whereas with us, we can't. If we, if we ask the bishop, look, we need some money for a holiday, well, the bishop will say, well, you know, good luck. Weren't you saving very well this year? You know, you'll know, you have to go to um, Rangiora for holiday because you can't, you can't get to Europe this year. So that, that's just one of the differences. But the key part is, and again, you know, I'd say ask a religious priest what it is to live... Um, that commitment of poverty as a religious. See, diocesan priests, we don't take um, a, a vow or promise of poverty because we live the poverty that every baptized person is called to. So um, while you've just drawn me in that question into a religious life, I bring it back to baptism. <laughs> so poverty, chastity, obedience are essential for every person who is baptized. Mm. And um, I'd go back and I'd, I'd say as well that the, the danger that we as diocesan priests, we can think, well, we need to learn about um, what it is as a diocesan priest to live um, the commitment of uh, celibacy um, or obedience or, um, um, or um, poverty. So we can go to a book in a theology library and I'd, the people who have taught me most about poverty and chastity and obedience are, are people I know in parishes who are single, who are married and who really are living these. So, so you, you are my teachers. Um, sure, I learned some theory about what um, the Vatican documents or the Pope says poverty and chastity and obedience are. Um, when we were in seminary, we, we learned this, and we studied, but my real teachers would be people in the parishes that I've, I've served. And I think the challenge comes for all of us when we, um, we think that poverty, chastity and obedience are what priests and religious live. Not, well, yes, but so too does everyone who is, um, who is baptized. And again, I go back to one of the first things I said, that it's, a, it's actually a beautiful way of living. But when we live in a way to speak about poverty from this kind of grasping at you know, what I need or what I'm going to get, that's exhausting. Or when I live um, chastity as a, as a Friday, if I use my sexuality on a Friday and Saturday night as an entertainment, well, those people don't look all that happy on a Monday morning. Sometimes I look happier on a Monday morning some of those people have done all of the things that the world says we need to do. And you know, I've had a quiet weekend and celebrated Mass three times, and on Monday morning I look happier. So we, we have to read the signs. You know, who are the people who look um, who look uh, happier, and how are they living? Um, yeah. So for those three vows, um, brings us to a state of exclusively giving ourselves more totally to God. Obviously. Uh, not because we want to choose to be poor or to be obedient, obedient, uh, obedient or chaste, but I guess, uh, I mean, the church defines very clearly, unless you love Christ so much, those things can become a burden, I guess. Um, what I want our young people to understand is that um, we don't have to start a religious life by following those rules, but the, the first place to begin is our love for Christ. So passionately, so totally, that those things become irrelevant and even get in the way. 
Is that the, the way that we understand? I think it's a great way of it's a great way of putting it. You see, we often think that living life as a Christian, and to be specific, as you were at the beginning, as a Catholic Christian, is a harder way to live. Well, if it were a harder way to live, if I thought it was a harder way to live, I wouldn't be doing it. I'm too, I'm too lazy. I don't have the passion. I'm too, you know, I tend to cop out of things too easily. In my experience, living as a Catholic Christian is the easiest way to live. Um, because life is coherent. It kind of, it, it makes sense. Like, you know, when, I, when I'm worried about something at two o'clock in the morning and can't sleep and I kind of pray, I think, well, the question I ask is, will this be an issue for me in 100 years? See, because I'm a Catholic Christian, I can think long term, not just will this be an issue next week. In fact, what I often realise when I ask the 100 year question is that it probably won't be an issue next week or tomorrow either. So why am I lying all that worried about this? So the thing I, I, I and the, the, the key I think is helping people to uh, reflect on their experience. So often I, I say to people, um, are you, well, you know, what's one of my key questions? What's that first question I used to ask? Are you happy, healthy, and holy? <laughs> this goes back, what, almost 15 years to when we... Yeah, when I first came to New Zealand, I was staying with him at Sokburn, and uh, every day when I came back from school, he asked me, <laughs> Tian, how are you? Are you happy, healthy, and holy? I normally say yes, yes, and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and sometimes it was maybe, yes, yes, or, uh, yeah. or maybe, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but the real question, you see, we need to reflect on our own experience. And this is all of us. This is not just young people um, who may be watching or, um, am I happy? And sometimes I say to people, are you happy? And they say, yeah, 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 I'm happy. Are you really happy? Yeah. Are you really, really happy? Yeah. <laughs> are you really, 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 really <laughs> happy? And they kind of say, Mm, no. <laughs> see, when we reflect on our experience, we begin to see actually there's some ways that I'm living, some things that I'm doing that are not delivering what they promise. See, there's a lot in the world that promises everything. But when we look at our experience of it, I mean, we can think of, um, you know, let's think drink, drug, sex, or whatever people say is what makes you happy. Are you really happy? Are you really, really, really happy? People say, well, no. So why do you do it then? Like, why not go for what delivers what it promises? Never settle for what doesn't deliver what it promises. Because what Christ offers us, what offers us, this is all of us, is a promise that's real. And so why would I spend any time or energy or money or resources on something that will deliver me a moment of satisfaction. Why don't I really set my goal high? And it, look, it seems to me that young people today are great at setting high goals. You know, you never hear someone say, look, my aim in life is to climb the Port Hills. <laughs> my aim in life is to climb Everest. Like, People are great at having these extraordinary, wonderful dreams. And people get excited when they talk about their dreams. Yeah. We've just um, come back from, um, I don't know how long this is going to be online for, but anyway, I'll, I'll say uh, just today, um, Father Tien and I have come back from um, a couple of days that the bishop asked us to have together in Hamlet Springs with all the priests who work in parishes. So for two days, we were all together. So we kind of lived together and we ate and drank together and talked. But one of the best questions we were asked was about dreaming. What are your dreams? And um, our seven youngest priests, who are interesting, all, all in their, how old are they? All of them are under 40. Early uh, 30s, mid 30s. So the youngest is 30. Uh, so they're all in their 30s, that group, pretty much. It's extraordinary. Seven of them. And they all spoke about their dream for life as a priest in the diocese. Look, I wish we could have all heard it. I wish that had been video. Look, it was, it was moving. It was just, here am I, an old guy. Um, when when um, 
When I was ordained a priest for 59, they were on the way out. Well, <laughs> but these guys shared about their dreams. Like, the, the dreams were big dreams. And they were exciting to hear. And when these guys were talking, they were excited. And when we were listening, we older guys were moved. Because, uh, I think it was Pope Benedict, was it, who said, you know, we're not made for comfort. We're made for greatness. Like the human person isn't made for comfort. We're made for greatness. Well, a healthy person wants to be to great. You know, if, you'll hear some priests say, um, when they get into their 60s, they are oh, looking forward to retirement. Well, look, I wish they'd retire now. We don't want them. <laughs> like, that's just, we, we want, you know, we want people who are excited about life because that's what's contagious. And um, it seems really odd to say it, but poverty, chastity, and obedience lived fully by any person is highly contagious. Because people say, whatever they've got, I want. Yeah. Some, some young people have expressed that they are not, not so satisfied with their lives and it's like there's no more for them to try. Now, some parents have expressed that my children seem to have a vocation to a religious life. What would you say to them? Like, where it's do you begin yeah. with your children? Well, I wonder what any of you who are watching who might be parents or grandparents, aunts, uncles, godparents, or, or anyone here who's watching. If someone aged 18, last year at school maybe, said to you, I'm thinking of being a priest, I'm going to apply to go to the seminary, what would you say to them? Don't say it out loud, but just from science think, what would you say? Well, in my experience, most good, committed Catholic parents, godparents, aunts, uncles, grandparents say something like wow that's great that's a great calling but go and live for two or three years you know do some study get a job travel have a relationship and then after two or three years when you're 21 or 22 and you come back then that's okay well, now what's that saying to the young person what it's saying in fact is priesthood's not really a life go and get life out of your system and then, if you've got life out of your system, then come back. Look, I was 18 when I went to the seminary. Mm -hmm. How old were you, Tim? I came here when I was 22, but I, my, my thought of becoming a priest was earlier. Ah. See, I, I was 18. My good family, on the whole, I'd have to say, tried to stop me. But some of you know me well enough to know that I'm pretty stubborn. Like, if I, if I decide this is what's going So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to let my... Um, family decide, I'll go and ask the bishop and see what he says. Well, they were just at the stage where they were saying people that are 18 are too young. Mm. Um, now, I hope I'm not going against a Dawson policy here, but if it is a Dawson policy, we should change it. Um, yeah. Because I know that I lived, in fact, when I left school, because people were saying go and get a job, I did get a job, I got a permanent job. But in the months that I worked there, I knew my heart was somewhere else. It wasn't, it wasn't so much I desperately wanted to be a priest, it's that I knew there was a step I had to take. And you see, someone who's, if they go to the seminary when they're 18 or 19, or apply when they're 18 or 19, it's like um, beginning to go out with a girlfriend when you're 18 or 19. You know, if one of your children or grandchildren comes home at 18 or 19 with a girlfriend, you don't say, no, you mustn't because you're too young to marry. They're not thinking of marriage. When someone goes to the seminary, ordination is seven years away. So it's like beginning a particular way of thinking. Now, certainly to be in some kind of discernment as a vocation director, before um, Father Tien, he was vocation director, I was the vocation director in the diocese. Um, but one of the things that we do as vocation director is accompany people who are thinking they might be 16 or 17. And if they approach us, we're not going to drag them into a seminary. Families shouldn't be worried about this. We're just going to begin to have the conversation with them to help them to discern where God's leading. Look, I meet a number of people who are in their 50s, 60s and 70s who say to me, I felt a calling to be a priest when I was at school. 
I've made a bit of a mess, like there's two or three marriages in there in the years since and that. I think I was called to be a priest. Now, we also know there are people who are called to be priests that in the years of um, discernment decide they're not. That, that's great. That means the discernment process, the seminary, is working. But why would we as family deprive anyone from doing what they're being called to do and what they were created to do. So I, I think as families, our encouragement has to be a lot more active. Like in the same kind of way, I want to climb Everest, would say, go for it. <laughs> go for it. You know, I want to, want to win the gold, at, um, you know, I want to sail the boat that wins the America's Cup. Go for it. That's and if they want to be a priest, we say, well, let's leave it for a few years. This is there's something. So I would say that the real issue we have in vocations is among good, committed Catholic families. Is that too much of a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we continue to pray for families with children who are thinking about giving their, their lives to God for the service of humanity as well. Um, last question, uh, if I go to a high school, how can I talk to young people about giving their life to, to God in a, through a vocation, either the priesthood or religious life or single consecration? What would be the first saying, thing that I say, hey, uh, Mr. Smith, can I talk to you about this? I think you have the gift of prayer and um, God may be calling you. What is the next thing that I would say to them? Okay, do you, this is for you as vocation yeah, director yeah. at a school. Right, okay. Um, this feels like being interviewed by Oprah, getting asked the, real, <laughs> the, the questions I wasn't expecting. Whatever comes up. Uh, <laughs> Look, uh, do you know, I, again, I'd go back to our Hamna Springs day, days. Like, there were 30 of us together. Like, my sense as I looked around, and even when we, we um, had a barbecue on the first night, which Tien cooked, yeah. it was very good. <laughs> no one was sick. <laughs> no one was sick. <laughs> well, you, yeah. I haven't felt very well since. Is it? <laughs> I've never connected it with the food. But then last night we went out to a restaurant at, um, uh, in Hamna, and um, I was there watching us. There was look, there was good laughter, there was conversation. The people at the other tables, like, I can't imagine what they thought. Yes, they're only we're all only men, and here we all are together, having a lot more fun. It seemed to me than many of the other tables. And I thought, gosh, if the people of our diocese could see priests together, you'd say, I'd be delighted if my son or grandson did that. If he could have a family like that. You see, how else could I have a brother from Vietnam? But Tien is my brother. Like, and you know, the old idea of families that are biological and they live within this quarter acre section is, is really a very, strange idea of family. Like family, especially as a Catholics, our family, we talk about the parish as our parish family, we talk about the church as a family. Well, the, the fraternity, the brotherhood, the friendship, the love among priests, and my sense is that if in a high school, sorry, I was going to answer your question. If only people could see that. But you see, you do see it sometimes, but you're part of the team that has to convey this. But when you say to your 17-year-old, um, oh, that's a good year, but go, go and live for a few years, what you're doing is saying, oh, we really would rather you didn't. Like, priesthood is. I, I know that I could not have had as fulfilling a life as I've had doing anything else, like working in a government department in Timaru. Like, it doesn't come close. You see, can I say one last thing? Yes. What, how long have we got? You never told me that. This is the right time. <laughs> can I say one more thing, please? <laughs> you see, we've got this idea that a priest is a coordinator of ministries or the manager of the parish. Functionality. A functionality. Look, I'm not attracted to that at all. I don't do it very well. For me, you know, the best definition of the priest for me, and the one I really strive to live by, the priest is the doctor of the soul. The priest, the doctor of the soul. Now, 
it, when I when I share that, even I get I, it's hard to talk about exactly what it means. But you know, we're not we're not bodies that have a soul. We are souls that have a body. So to be a priest, to be the doctor of the soul, like some days within an eight hour period, 12 hour period, I'm at the hospital with someone who's dying. And while I'm there, I anoint them and we pray and they die at the end of a long, full life. I go back down and get back into my car if it's Christchurch Hospital, you have to walk half an hour to get back to your car. Or get this. And the phone rings and someone just had a baby. Oh, now I'm excited. And I put down the receiver and the phone rings and this couple want to get married. That's great. And then there's a finance meeting or those kinds of things as well. But even when I'm at the finance meeting or the parish council meeting, people say, look, Father, can I just chat to you about something? and they drag you out and you have this three minute conversation about the soul. Now, can you imagine a life that's more exciting than people expecting you to be a doctor of the soul and coming to you when they've got soul problems now, or soul concerns or soul anxieties or questions like, there's got to be more to life. So a lot of people come to me and say, look, look, I'm 40, I'm married, got beautiful wife, beautiful kids. We're all happy, job's great, we can holiday overseas each year, it's, well not now, but you know, we could holiday overseas each year, but there's got to be more. I say, yes, you're in the right place, there is, there is more. Because we know that the healthy human person knows there's more, there's, even because even, even when we win lotto, we're happy for a week. But then there's got to be something more, like there's always, but that's our healthiness, that's not a flaw. That restlessness is not a flaw in our humanity, it's a healthy note. I've said enough. Hey, thank you very much for your wisdom and uh, your personal testimony. We can see how excited you were to share with everybody about your journey of uh, faith and also the vocation. Um, as you say, Christ lives in you when you do his work. And that is the beauty of being the doctor of the soul, that if you live the life of Christ as a priest, then Christ actually lives in you and the kingdom of God is truly in us as well. And we thank God for this vocation uh, for men or women or parents who are thinking that your children may be thinking about the gift of religious life. Like we talked at the beginning, um, you can talk to your parish priest and talk to any priest as well. They will guide you along. But those three evangelical uh, virtues of chastity, obedience and poverty really liberate us to be free to follow Christ more wholeheartedly. And it's not only for those spe specialists like us, but those who are baptized as well. Everyone who is baptized call to that perfection of holiness to imitate the life of Christ. We hope that our conversation brings you um, a bit of resonation in your heart or someone that you might be thinking of. Please pray for them. And uh, thank you, Father John. May God bless you. So pray for them. And when did you last approach someone in your family or who you saw at mass or on the street and say, have you ever thought of priesthood? Because the number of people who are in seminaries and who are priests because someone yes. tapped them on the shoulder, even youngish men who mightn't be at mass and you can see them kind of wandering in their life. Don't worry whether or not they come to mass. That's all part of the growth process. But say, have you ever thought of priesthood? They'll say, well, we don't go to mass. It's like, oh, we all got to start somewhere. <laughs> But say it to them, like, and that's us all taking part in the work of the vocation director. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Goldman.